Living longer. Living healthier. Living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Many different people can make up your healthcare team, including doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and of course, you. But today we're going to talk about another important member of your healthcare team, physical therapists. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm your host, Beth Brown, and today we're going to talk about how physical therapy might fit into your healthcare journey and can be an important part of healthy aging. Stay with us. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Joining us today is Tennille Nelson, an inpatient or acute care physical therapist who works at Ivinson Memorial Hospital in Laramie, Wyoming. And thanks so much for being here today, Dr. Nelson. Thank you. So let's go ahead and dive right in. This might seem like a simple question, but for those people who don't really have the experience, what is physical therapy? Um, yeah, so physical therapy is a medical profession which focuses on just the physical functioning of a, of a person. Um, and really we see patients across the lifespan. So from infants, um, newborns, uh, all the way to the older adult population. So we really, we're lucky enough to work with the whole lifespan. Um, and we just focus on the physical limitations that people have, um, you know, the, those barriers for their physical functioning that really affect their quality of life. And so why might a person have a decrease or a barrier in physical function? Um, you know, that decrease can result from a lot of different things, um, from an impairment in your musculoskeletal system, the neurological system, cardiopulmonary system, integumentary system, lymphatic system, um, congenital conditions, as well as various acute and chronic illnesses. If you've had surgery um, or even an accident of some kind, um, really there's you know so many different causes of, of physical dysfunction. Um, okay. Well, with the medical community as well. So a lot of those require medical treatment, but then also um, we treat the physical limitations that result from all of these different impairments. Okay, sure. And so what might that look like? Can you give us some examples of a decrease in physical function? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And really it's a, it's a whole spectrum. Um, you know, examples include when someone has difficulty with basic activities. Um, in, in my world, those are called activities of daily living, but things like getting dressed, being able to cook a meal, feed yourself, um, go to the bathroom, things like that, trouble getting out of bed, standing up, walking, um, balance, doing stairs, all the way to, you know, if you're having difficulty participating in all of the different um, roles that you might have in your life, such as exercising, hobbies, job activities, family obligations, caring for children or grandchildren, if any of those things are limited by physical limitations, um, that's what I mean by decreased mobility. And, you know, these decreases in physical function can result from a lot of different things like I touched on earlier, but things like joint pain, decreased strength, abnormal sensation in part of your body. If you have abnormal gait or walking, decreased balance, wounds, um, lymphedema, which is swelling, um, weakness due to illness, acute illnesses, chronic illnesses, decreased coordination, dizziness, and, and lots of other reasons. Okay. So would you say that physical therapy is typically for those people who have severe cases of some kind of physical function decrease? Um, so yes, definitely for those individuals, but also it's, you know, it's a spectrum. So um, not just the severe cases, really we can address even things that might be considered minor complaints like intermittent joint pain, subtle impairments in walking and balance, maybe a slight decrease in strength. I mean, really anything that is affecting your quality of life from a physical limitation, no matter how minor you might think it would be. So across the whole spectrum. Okay, and so then why would someone seek out physical therapy for one of those more minor conditions or injuries? Um, yeah, well, as we age, um, almost everybody has some sort of minor injury or condition that can impact your quality of life. 
um, left unaddressed, these impairments can really become big problems. Uh, and one of the benefits of physical therapy is really we try to teach people how to take care of themselves and how to treat themselves. So um, an example I'll use is, you know, maybe an individual enjoys gardening, um, but they have back pain with gardening or maybe um, a pre-existing injury or, or something, some reason why they can't participate in gardening. Um, a physical therapist can give you some strategies like exercise, stretches, um, et cetera, that can decrease your back pain so you can actually participate in gardening. Um, as long as you keep up these strategies, then you can keep up the gardening, which is an important part of having a good quality of life. Um, if you don't address that, you might not be able to participate in that activity that's really important to you. Okay. So. so where does the person go to get physical therapy? You know, there's a variety of settings where a person would have physical therapy. Um, they include in a person's home with home health. Um, if you're a, a kiddo, it might be in daycare or school. Um, there's outpatient clinics, which I think most of the population is familiar with. Um, you can have physical therapy in a hospital, in a nursing home, or there's even dedicated rehabilitation hospitals, which physical therapy along with occupational therapy and speech therapy are a really big part of what happens in those dedicated rehab hospitals. Okay, so you touched on some of the benefits of physical therapy. Does a person who might be interested in looking into physical therapy need to talk with their primary care doctor first? Um, so, you know, I guess my answer is yes and no. Okay. <laughs> it's always good to talk to your physician about you know, anything that's going on with you. Um, however, I, I will say that, you know, you don't always have to seek out your physician first to seek out physical therapy care. In all 50 states, you can, you can seek out physical therapy care without a referral from a physician. However, know that not all insurances will cover physical therapy without that first visit and referral from your physician and Medicare is one of those. So, um, you know, you can, but in some cases, if you want your insurance to pay for it, you do need that physician's referral first. Okay, that's good to know. I'm sure people were interested <laughs> to know about the cost. So that's really helpful. Yeah. We do need to pause here, just to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the mobility concerns that happen when we age and how physical therapy might be able to help. So stay with us. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back. We're still talking with Dr. Tennille Nelson, who is an inpatient or acute care physical therapist. And so now we're going to talk about how physical therapy can tie into mobility issues. So thanks for sticking around so we can talk about that, Dr. Nelson. Yeah. And let's talk about why mobility is important and what can cause a loss of mobility. Um, in my experience over the last 15 years or so, when I discuss what's important to my patients with them. Um, and I primarily work with older adults and, and have for the majority of my um, career. You know, the, the number one answer I get really is I wanna maintain my independence and be in my home as I age, um, you know? And, and so there's a number of factors that contribute to an older adult's ability to maintain independence and um, staying in their own home as they age. But really mobility is definitely one of the big ones. Um, you know, if you can't safely move about your home, independently navigate the stairs that you have in your home, um, perform again, those activities of daily living that I mentioned earlier, things like getting dressed, bathing, using the bathroom, eating, um, really the reality is it's very difficult to maintain independence in your home. So, you know, mobility is a big part of all of that. Um, and then kind of to the second part of your question, losing mobility is, is multifactorial. Um, it can be due to a loss of joint range of motion and pain, loss of strength, decreased balance, decreased endurance, dizziness, decreased sensation, you know, and all these things come about um, by decreased in cardiovascular and pulmonary function, possibly a neurological condition, um, aging itself, acute illness, and just chronic illness can cause all of these things. Okay, so you talked about independence. What are some mm -hmm. of the consequences that can happen if a person loses strength or, or loses some mobility? Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the big one that comes to mind when talking about 
um, the aging population. And then also what I see a lot in my work in a hospital is um, poor balance and falls, which results in fractures. Um, you know, that's a that's a big one in the older adult population is is having fractures. Hip fractures um, are, are a big uh, cause of morbidity and mortality in the aging population. And so that's a big one. But then also just things like the decreased ability to walk, the decreased ability to, like I mentioned earlier, navigate stairs, um, access both your community environments and your home environments. Um, and the decreased ability to perform those activities of daily living, like I mentioned. And kind of what's, to put it all into perspective is it goes back to quality of life. Um, when you can't perform these things safely and effectively, really it results in a decreased quality of life, which is what physical therapists want to address is really that quality. And so then I think the big question is, how does physical therapy help with all of that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, really my profession and my colleagues, we are the experts in, in movement. Um, and so, you know, we can evaluate an individual and identify what's contributing to their decreased or impaired physical functioning and mobility. Um, and then with that information, what we can do is prescribe activities to address, address those impairments or those causes of decreased mobility. You know, and if it's a medical cause of decreased mobility, something such as a stroke and individuals who's had a stroke, we of course work clo closely with the medical team to both have the medical team, team treat that patient medically, and then we address the physical functioning that results from, or the lack of physical functioning that results from the stroke. Okay, and so you said that you start out with an evaluation, that you evaluate the individual. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to depend a little bit on the setting and a little bit of, you know, on kind of what's going on with that patient, but really we can evaluate your strength, your joint range of motion, your gait, your balance, um, the sensation, specifically in kind of your feet and ankles, your endurance, and any of the other systems involved um, to determine if somebody is at higher risk for falling or if they fall below normal ranges for things like walking or endurance or strength. Um, so really just taking a look at that whole body physical functioning to see where the impairments lie. Okay, great. And then you mentioned gait and endurance and sensation. Can you talk about that a little more? What, did, what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so gait, simply put, is, is walking. Um, and interestingly, physical therapists and, and your doctors um, can tell a lot about how well an individual is fun functioning by observing the speed and the quality with which you walk. Um, there's a lot of uh, information out there and a lot of research studies out there that really can um, you know, identify how valuable that observation is. Um, the slower you walk, the worse you're doing as far as functioning goes. Um, the better you walk, the more normal you walk, uh, the better you're probably doing as far as function goes. Um, when I talk about sensation, I really mean the sensation in a person's feet, which not only includes like the skin, and, um, but also the joints in your feet and ankles as well. The ability to feel your feet and also to feel kind of where your ankle is as far as bending or straightening, um, the position of your ankle is really important for maintaining balance. So if this is lacking, if you're lacking a little bit of sensation in the skin in your feet or even in the position of your ankles. Um, PTs can work on other strategies and teach the older adult other strategies for maintaining balance. Um, and then endurance is really just a person's ability to sustain activity. Um, and as a physical therapist, I'm not really concerned if you have the endurance to run a marathon, if, unless that's of course the um, individual's goals. But um, Really what I'm most concerned with is if you have enough endurance to accomplish what you wanna do throughout the day. Um, for example, do you have enough endurance to stand and cook a meal, to walk to the mailbox, and then to participate in your favorite hobby throughout the day? Um, so really it all goes back to quality of life. And these things matter because quality of life matters. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I just wanna work with, work with patients to try and achieve the highest quality they can. Okay, awesome, thank you. We are actually butted right up against another break, so we need to pause again here, Dr. Nelson, but we're going to look at planning for mobility and how to keep your independence, so stay with us, we'll be right back.
Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Dr. Nelson has stuck around to talk to us some more, and now we're going to talk about planning for an independent future, which I know a lot of people are going to want to hear about. So thanks again for sticking around, Dr. Nelson. So before we do jump into planning for the future though, let's talk about mobility and some of the more common conditions that are often seen in older adults. Yeah, so being in a hospital setting, because I do work in a hospital, I see the more extreme end of the spectrum with respect to difficulty with mobility. Um, and really what this typically looks like for me is um, pain or decreased strength and endurance after an acute medical illness. Um, but across all settings of physical therapy, I think the most common conditions include joint pain, decreased strength, decreased balance and falls, um, and then addressing the mobility parts of neurological conditions such as strokes, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and other neurological conditions. And of course, all of those conditions can relate to whether someone can stay independent in their home. So let's talk about maybe some of the more commonly overlooked aspects that people might not realize could contribute to them losing some of their independence. Okay, um, so, you know, really maintaining physical dependence um, can be a priority as people age. So some of the um, commonly overlooked things is, you know, it's important to start planning for mobility as you age, just like you plan, you know, financially for retirement. Um, it is important to plan, you know, for maintaining physical mobility and independence as you age. Um, so really thinking about your home environment, because sometimes a home environment can be a barrier as uh, mobility gets more difficult. Um, so whatever physical barriers there might be in your home, things such as multiple stairs, um, inaccessible bathrooms and bedrooms, multi-level homes, um, and even just a cluttered environment, uh, you know, can, can pose tripping hazards. Um, and so some of those things, if you address them now, you can, can maintain independence in your environment as you age because there's less barriers. Okay, that's great. And so what steps would you recommend then so that older people can stay independent for as long as possible? Um, you know, so just making small modifications to their home, things like putting a rail up on any stairs that they might have. Because, um, like, you know, a common occurrence for me is that an older adult um, who has been hospitalized due to a medical, um, a medical condition does inevitably lose a little bit of strength as a result of being ill. And so, you know, once their medical condition has been addressed, um, sometimes they can't be discharged from the hospital because they are, um, they have physical limitations now as a result of that illness. And so if that particular scenario, if that individual has multiple stairs to get into their home, um, but they don't have a handrail to, you know, utilize and help support them as they go up into their home, you know, they might have to stay in the hospital a little bit longer just to gain that strength back, just simply because there was no, you know, way for them to assist themselves into the into the home because of those stairs. Um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, having your home, again, decluttered so that you could use a walker if you need to do that for a short period of time, um, things like that. Uh, so you just don't want any physical barriers being um, the barrier to you going home from the hospital. Are there some physical activities that folks can add into their routine weekly or daily that might help keep them more mobile? Um, yeah, so if you have stairs in your home, I suggest sort of a, a training regimen on those stairs so that really, instead of just going up or down them once or twice within a day, um, you know, make a point to go up and down the stairs multiple times throughout the day so that you really build up um, the strength in your legs and the endurance in your heart and lungs that it takes to do those stairs. If, for example, you were to get ill for a few days and have a little bit of decreased strength as a result, you've got a little reserve there so that really those stairs are no longer a barrier to accessing your home or even the second level of your home where your bedroom might be. Um, and I'm a huge proponent of walking. Walking is a really great activity. Uh, and really the research supports doing um, shorter intervals multiple times a day. Um, and really that's the equivalent of continuous exercise. And what I mean is if you wanted to, you could break up um, walking into three 10 minute segments 
And really that, that will give you the same benefit as walking for 30 minutes continuously. Um, so just trying to plan for those activities that you need to do in your home and really training for those activities throughout the day. Perfect. Okay, and you did mention walkers a little bit earlier too. Can you talk about, are people generally open to using those kind of assistive devices or are those seen as barriers? Can you talk about that a little bit and why those devices might be important? Um, yeah, so um, not, not all people, but a lot of people are resistant to using various walking aids like walkers or canes. Um, the most kind of common um, comment I get when I suggest that as an option would be, you know, that'll, that'll make me look old. Yeah. Um, and, and I acknowledge that feeling and that's a, that's a very real reaction to my suggestion. Um, but I try to really reframe that in a context of, again, you know, quality of life. So using a cane or a walker can prevent you from falling and potentially having a fracture. Really, that is very, very important because, as I mentioned earlier, fractures contribute to uh, morbidity and mortality in the older adult population. And so preventing that is worth using a cane or a walker, in my opinion. In addition to that, that's kind of an extreme example, but in addition to that, you know, using a walking aid like a cane or a walker can make an individual more efficient in their walking and conserve their energy so that really that could ultimately be the difference between you know, being able to go out in the community and participate in an activity that's meaningful to you versus, you know, being out of energy by the end of the day and not wanting to participate in that. So, you know, really seeing those as a tool to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish in a day and live the kind of life that you want to live in your home, um, those are aids to do that. They're not a, a barrier and they will not make you look old. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, we're out of time. One final thought you want to make sure we hear today? Um, you know, I'm just really honored to have this opportunity to explain how my profession and my colleagues can, can contribute to the quality of life in the, in the older adult population. It's really important. And so thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. We sure appreciate having you here, Dr. Nelson. That was a lot of great information. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for tuning in and watching us. We hope you'll come back and see us again next week. Until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Have a great week, everybody. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health in partnership with AARP Montana. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the Healthy Living for Life logo. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.